I'm going to jump right into it because this is going to be deep tonight. Amen. And some of you think it's deep all the time. It's going to get really deep tonight. And uh, I'm going to share with you things that I'm finally ready to um, share with you. Things I'm now ready to, to present. And it's things that I've been studying and meditating for years. And see, when I come over here and teach, I'm teaching you guys things that I've been assured of. I'm not teaching you things that I'm speculating on. But in studying and meditating, because we're, we're doing the book of Hebrews on Wednesday nights, and in studying and meditating on the book of Hebrews for years, I've come to see and understand some things that for the longest time I was seeing darkly through a glass, but I've come over the years to be able to see them face to face, and I'm, I'm ready now to present them to you. And what that is, is that the mystery of Christ, as laid out in the Pauline epistles, concerning Christ's body and God's holy habitation through the Spirit being received up into glory and purifying the heavenly places is essential in understanding how salvation and righteousness will be brought to the earth through Israel under the new covenant. The mystery of Christ is the means by which God is going to fulfill His promises in the prophetic scriptures. And I've come to understand this by studying and meditating upon these things for years and years. Like why does Paul quote Isaiah 64 in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? Why does he quote Isaiah 59, 20, and 21 in Romans 11, 26? Why does he quote Isaiah 25 and 8 and Hosea 13, 14 and 1 Corinthians 15, 55? Why does he make a little three-letter reference to Isaiah 45, 17 in Ephesians 3, 21? Why is he quoting Psalm 68, 18 as it pertains to the body of Christ in Ephesians 4, 8? Why is he making a loose reference to Isaiah 60 and 1 in, Isaiah 5, 4, in, in Ephesians 5.14? These are things that I've studied and meditated upon for years. And I'm now coming to see these things more clearly, eye to eye, as the Old Testament said it, face to face as Paul said it. And so I'm now ready to present these things to you. And so it is my belief that Hebrews must be understood in light of the fullness of Christ in the heavenly places that Paul laid out in his epistles. You are not going to understand Hebrews to Revelation and the fulfillment of prophetic scripture without understanding the fullness of Christ in the heavenly places and the mystery that was laid out by Paul. Amen? For example, in Hebrews 2, 5, it says, Under the angels he hath not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Well, then who's the world to come subject to? Jesus, Jesus Christ. What did we learn? I'll put it to you like this. Compare Hebrews 2, 5, and the doctrine laid out there about all things being put under his feet, and compare it with Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. Amen? What about, what about Hebrews chapter 5? Hebrews 5, 12, or Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 2. You say, what's that one about? That's about milk and meat. The meat of this passage right here is the mystery that God ordained before the world unto our glory. And he's got many things to tell the Hebrew people concerning a high priest that has passed into the what? But they're not able to bear it. You know what he says there? You want to know what that writer of Hebrews says? That he's made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. You know how much material there is on Melchizedek in the Old Testament? About six verses. And he proclaims to have many things to say that are hard to be uttered. Well, you think you, think you can go back and study Genesis 14 and Psalm 110 and verse 4 and get any more out of it than anybody else in history? 
So where's all this material about this high priest that has passed into the heavens? That he says is strong meat that belongs to them that are full of age. That are of full age. And Paul said this wisdom is for them that are perfect. Amen. Left you already? What about Hebrews 8? About Hebrews 8, 4 through 5. You know what that passage says there? That if Christ were on earth, he should not be a priest. If he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Why? Seeing there are priests that are off that offer gifts and sacrifices according to what? Who serve unto the shadow and example of heavenly things. So what do the priests on earth serve under? Heavenly things. A shadow and example of heavenly things. And Paul told you in Colossians 2, 16-17 not to let any man judge you in meat, drink, respect of a holy day, new moon, Sabbath days, which are not were. He didn't say they were a shadow. He says they are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And then you can run that right to Hebrews 9.11 where Jesus Christ is made a high priest of good things to come. Okay? Don't worry about trying to understand it now, guys. You're getting into the realm of the deep things of God. When Paul talks about comprehending height, breadth, depth, and length, these are the things he's talking about. Amen? Hebrews 12, 23 says that they've not come unto the mountain which might be touched, that burned with fire and all those things. He says, but you've come unto Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written where? You know what he just you know where he just told them Jews they're coming to? How he's talking about the mountain of their new covenant. Their old covenant was made at Mount Sinai. And he said, You didn't that mountain was so holy that if you touched it, you died. How much more holy do you need to be as, as you approach this city of the living God? But notice who he says they've approached unto. Angels, the general assembly, and church of who? Written where? You know where the church of the firstborn was identified? Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. You say, where does it call it the church of the firstborn? Verse 15. He is the firstborn of every creature. And he is the head of the body, the church. So what's that mean? The body of Christ is the church of the firstborn. And that's who these Jews are coming to under their new covenant. Now it's all there. Amen? Like I've said, guys, I've studied and meditated upon these things and been like just looking at these things darkly through a glass. And over the years, I began to meditate upon them. And begin to see him more and more. And so before we continue in Hebrews, I want to spend some time showing you the fellowship of the mystery laid out in Paul's epistles to the scriptures of the prophets. And how that mystery is going to bring about the eternal purpose of God that he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The eternal purpose of God is this right here. Mystery plus prophecy equals eternal purpose of God which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those things go together in this. These two things are distinct and must be rightly divided but they're also in fellowship with one another. Amen? 
And though I do not yet fully comprehend the full treasures, as Paul said, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Though I have not yet fully comprehended the full treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge and all those treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hid in the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, though I've not yet fully comprehended it, it is evident to me that when I study Paul's epistles, he does not mention the mystery without immediately quoting prophecy. Not a single time. Romans eleven twenty five. he immediately quotes Isaiah 59, 20 and 21. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, he immediately quotes Isaiah 64 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I show you a mystery, he immediately quotes Isaiah 25 and 8. And Hosea 13, 14. Amen? When he gets done talking about the mystery... When he gets done in Ephesians chapter 3, he closes it by saying, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That phrase, world without end, is only in your Bible one other time, and it's Isaiah 45, 17. And it's about an anointed Gentile who has been anointed by God for the salvation of his people Israel. Go read it. Amen? You know what he tells that Gentile over there? You know what he tells him? In Isaiah 45, you know what God says to Cyrus? I've given thee the treasures of darkness and the secret riches of hidden places. What was Paul sent to do? Preach unto the Gentiles what? The unsearchable riches of Christ. And then immediately Paul's quoting Isaiah 45, 17. And he doesn't make it clear he's quoting it. He doesn't make it clear. He doesn't say, as it is written. Amen? You say, what are you, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the fact that if you don't take the Bible serious, it's going to go clear right over your head. And you're never going to know it went over your head. Because like I've told people, tell me, I've had, I had a guy here ask me one time, why, God, why didn't God just make this stuff plain? Because it's His glory to conceal a thing. And it's your honor to search it out. Amen? That's the way God does it. Christ said, I thank thee that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed well in thine own sight. That's why God does things like that. Puts a little three, puts a little three word phrase there. As a, as a reference, world without end, and says you'll find it or you won't. And if you find it and you search me diligently, you're going to unlock the depths of my wisdom and knowledge. And if you don't, sorry about your luck. Amen? Amen. You say... You say, preacher, you really think that's the way God did it? Absolutely, I think that's the way God did it. And I think people spend more time researching their fantasy football team next year than they do studying the Word of God. And then wondering why they can't understand things. I think people know more about what's going on in the NFL and the NBA and, and baseball and everything else. And they got a book here containing the depths of God's wisdom and knowledge the depths of the wisdom and knowledge of our Creator as it pertains to the eternal purpose of God. And yes, it's hard. And yes, it's difficult. But what are you going to do? Stay stupid? Because that's your choice. And so when I say it's evident, I've already gave you the passages. When I say it's evident that Paul always quotes prophecy in connection with the mystery, I mean it. And it's your responsibility to find out what he's quoting and go back and study those things. And if it, if it don't immediately jump out to you, just keep studying it. Keep meditating upon it. Amen? Because you know what you're going to find out? 
That little reference he gives you to Isaiah 59 and Romans 11, 26, you know what you're going to find in Isaiah 59? You're going to find the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, which is only mentioned two other times, and it's by Paul in Ephesians 6 and 1 Thessalonians 5. That's good. And yeah, I, I found it a long time ago. And it's thrown me for a whirlwind for about seven years. And I kept studying it, meditating upon it, thinking about it. And finally getting a little bit of understanding of what's transpiring back there in Isaiah 59. And the mystery's relationship to that prophecy of Isaiah 59. And so when God promised the Redeemer would come to Zion, guess what he had hid? That. But God, this wasn't hid from God. When God's speaking in prophecy, He's already purposed this. And so a lot of what He's promising in prophecy is based upon His fulfillment of this mystery that He's already purposed in Himself. And so look here in Romans 16, 25 now. I read that phrase like this, now to Him. That's Paul directing you. Out of the book of Romans, he's now directing you and transferring you to something else. Now to him. Now get, go to your father, you know. And so he's saying, now what is he talking about here? He's talking about a transfer to this power of God to establish you. You're being transferred to the power of God to establish us. And the reason I say it's a transfer is because the book of Romans began with the power of God unto salvation. Those are the bookends of the book of Romans. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto what? Salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. End of the book. Now to him that is of power to establish you. You know what that means? Salvation and establishment are two different things. You can be saved and never be established. Two different things. Right? There's a power of God unto salvation, everyone that believeth. Where's that power at? It's in the gospel of Christ. When that gospel of Christ is preached to everyone that believeth, that gospel is God's power unto salvation. But as a saved person, after salvation, it's now time to be established by God. Amen? And so that's how the book of Romans begins and ends. You know how you know another interesting book end in the book of Romans? Second verse which he had which he had promised before by his prophets in the holy scriptures. Last last chapter, last few verses, preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Something promised before, something kept secret. Power of God unto salvation, power of God to establish you. You're going to notice that the more you study the Word of God, the more you're going to notice all these little patterns in it. But right now, I just want to emphasize that when you come to the end of the book of Romans, now it's time for you to be established. Amen? Paul talks about this establishment. What is it? What is the power of God to establish you? It's, it's through obedience of faith to what God has made known to all nations. Amen? Yeah. You're not established through five or six verses out of the Word of God. No. Paul lays it out here. My gospel, revelation of the mystery, scriptures of the prophets. So let me ask you this. Can you, as a Christian, be established if you yourself are not reading the scriptures of the prophets. I'll go a step further. Did Paul tell the body of Christ to sing to themselves in Psalms? Yes, sir. That means all 150 Psalms were to be understood, read, sung, quoted, and spoken by the body of Christ in teaching and admonishing one another. Amen. Not just speaking to yourself. You know how many times I've quoted the 32nd Psalm to myself? Or the 51st Psalm? 
Or how about Psalm 2.12, blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. You know how many times I've quoted that? Amen? And not only are you to speak those Psalms to yourself, you're to speak them and teach one another and admonish one another with those Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Right here's a hymnal. You know, I believe we should speak these things. They don't have to be perfect, guys. You got a perfect book right here. This is imperfect men. They had doubts, fears, troubles, sufferings, sicknesses. Those songs are meant to admonish you. And these med acts people go through and go, oh, my God, I got to correct it. If you're so spiritual, write your own hymns. Quit messing with everybody else's. But you see, the point I'm making is, guys, is that God's power to establish you is in what He has made known to all nations for obedience of faith. That means establishment is when your faith is in obedience to what God has made known to all nations and He shows you where He made it known. In Paul's Gospel, Revelation of the Mystery, and the Scriptures of the Prophets. All three are necessary. Amen? And so when we talk about Paul's Gospel, right? My Gospel is the first thing. Look at Colossians chapter 2. I want to show you this first. Colossians chapter 2 about being established. Guys, I'm just getting a foundation of where we're going. You know what? I'm a dispensationalist. I have been for, good grief, man, going on 18 years, 19 years. I started learning how to rightly divide when I was 24 years old. I'm 43. I learned things from Ruckman. I learned things from Larkin, Schofield. I learned things from Jordan. I learned, a, but guess what, guys? Those men wouldn't have got anywhere with me if I wouldn't have spent that time in that book. And so people come to me all the time, where'd you learn right division from? The Word of God? And I don't plan on stopping where you decided to camp. I plan on pressing toward the mark, boys. Coming into the excellency of the knowledge of this thing. That I may comprehend height, breadth, depth, and length. I ain't going to stop where some camp stopped. I didn't get where I'm at by not reading the book. I got where I'm at by reading the book and God has promised me that if I'm faithful with it, He'll keep giving it to me. The moment I put my hands up and say, I don't like how this is going to make me look is the moment He's going to shut off His revelation to me. The more you care more about impressing the camp then you do how you appear in the sight of God is the day he's going to shut off Revelation and you'll start having to write books about the King James Bible because you've run out of stuff to teach. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this establishment is accomplished by obedience of faith to what God has made known. Look at Colossians 2.5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving." What's he mean, established in the faith, as ye have been taught? Right here. Running around telling preachers, oh, you're spending a little too much time in the Old Testament, ain't going to cut it. Old Proverbs ain't, you know, and all this stuff, it ain't going to cut it, man. A man who's not established in both of these is not established in the faith. And he has no idea what this is even about if he don't understand this. And he don't understand how this is going to be brought to pass if he don't understand this. Because they go hand in hand in the eternal purpose of God which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? 
How many Lords are there? There's not two for each program. How many faiths? How many God and fathers? How many spirits? Okay. Now, what has God made known for the obedience of faith? Well, if God's going to establish you, He's going to establish you according to this right here. You can't get out of this thing. You can't beat this thing with a stick. You can get mad at me and get upset and go home snorting and snotting and do all you want to do. You can't get out of this. How many powers, how many of y'all, how many of y'all think there's another power of God to salvation outside of the gospel of Christ? Well, how many of y'all think that there's a power to establish you outside of these three things that Paul lays out right here? This is him taking you now after he has laid the foundation of Romans and he's saying now to him that is of power to establish you. And if you want to be established, it's going to be according to this pattern right here that Paul lays out. Number one, according to what? My gospel. Now, when Paul was separated under the gospel of God, it was something that God had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so even though Paul's gospel contains revelations and things that have been kept secret, it is still in accordance and a part of the overall gospel of God that he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul was separated unto something that God had promised. And watching these people try to rightly divide themselves out of that is comical at times. They end up with 15 Gospels before you get out of Romans chapter 1. Gospel of God, Gospel of Christ. What is the Gospel of God defined by Paul? What is it? Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what that means? The gospel of God is everything that God has made known and testified concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. His birth, His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, His exaltation, His headship, His body, His rapture, His return at the second coming, His kingdom, and His delivering all things back to God the Father. It's everything and your mystery is a part of the gospel of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so when Paul says, God's power to establish you according to my gospel, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 or chapter 1. You've got to understand that when Paul, you know, he's over in England. And the first message I preached was justification under eternal life. You know why? Because I'm following the pattern of Paul. When he come to Corinth, he determined not to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Yep. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You know what that means? Our job is not to entice men with fancy speech. Our job is to preach the cross. And it is either going to be foolish, the effect of that message, Christ dying for our sins, being buried and risen again the third day, that message has a twofold effect. It is foolishness to them that perish, and it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. And God has defined that message to have a negative effect as much as a positive effect. That message was designed by God to bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent and to destroy the wisdom of the wise. Amen. That's it. But he also designed that message to save them that believe. Amen? And so that message has a twofold effect in the world. It destroys the wisdom of the wise and it saves them that believe. And what you end up with is we preach Christ crucified unto who? Jews and who? Greeks. We preach that message because it is God's power unto salvation to everyone that what? And so we preach that message 
to the Jews and to the Greeks. To this one, it is what? A stumbling block. To that one, foolishness. But unto both of them that are called Christ, the wisdom of God, and the power of God. And so through this message, God is calling Jews and Greeks for something. We learn about what it is at the end of the chapter. You see your calling, brethren. Take a look at your calling. Did God call the educated or the mighty or the generals or the presidents or the kings or the nobles? Take a look around you. Look at this church. Who are we? Right? And so this message is calling out a people and this people are being called out to confound and to bring to naught the things that are. And so God is calling out a people through this message for a specific purpose. All right, so you got that. That's Paul's gospel. It's the preaching of the cross to the Jews and to the Greeks. The ones who don't believe it are them that perish. Those that believe it are saved and are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, that's God's power unto salvation, but that's not where it stops. Notice, to him that is of power to establish you according to what? What's that word right there? So there's something else in addition to Paul's gospel that brings the power of God to establish you. What is it? The preaching of Jesus Christ. Now, remember what we said. Separated under the gospel of God, which he had afore promised by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the gospel of God concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. And that gospel, the full gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, is contained in two parts. The preaching of Jesus Christ, the full gospel of God concerning Christ contains a mystery that had been kept secret since the world began, and it also contains the things that God had promised afore by His prophets and the Holy Scriptures. But you see this right here? That mystery kept secret and the things promised afore by God and the Holy Scriptures through the prophets, those two things right there make up the gospel of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And you, as a part of this one, don't get to ignore this one, and these don't get to ignore that. Because they're working together for this right here. This is what Paul calls the whole family in heaven and in earth. Amen? Now, we are established by both. Now, you see this preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You see that? I mean, how many of y'all think Paul would write something like that and you not know what he's talking about? Or he just left you clueless as to what he was talking about? I mean, the first book, the first book you come to written by Paul is a Gentile, is Romans. And he closed it and says, God's power to establish you is in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Well, he only mentioned mystery one other time in Romans. He only mentioned it one other time and it's right here. Well, right there. It's the only time he mentions the mystery in Romans 11.25. So what, what am I saying? I'm saying that when you get to the end of Romans, Paul's telling you that there's a preaching of Jesus Christ that's in accordance to this mystery right here. He didn't give it to you. That's the foundation of it. That's the foundation of it that so many, so many have refused to acknowledge. So many saved people so many justified, saved people are ignorant of this mystery. Amen? Yes, true. The on, this is the only mystery Paul mentioned in Romans. And so that means that back here, 
there is a preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of this right here. There's a whole preaching and body of doctrine that's in accordance to this mystery. And that's where God's power to establish you is. That's where you are to go after the gospel. Then you know where you go after the mystery? You go to the scriptures of the prophets. Because the mystery unveils the prophets. And it shines light on those prophetic scriptures and the promises God had made in those prophetic scriptures. But you are to go to the mystery next. Now, notice here, now watch this guys. I got Romans eleven thirty three through 34 up here, why? Because as a Christian, you're going to come to a crossroads. Amen? I've been, in, I've been in churches since I was this big right here, man. You ain't going to kid me. I've been in Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, free will churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches. My grandfather used to sing. And they had a tour bus, and I'd ride around with them as a little kid. And I've been in just about every church you can imagine. And if I had to sum up all those churches that I've observed in my life right there, would be how I summed them up. <laughs> we had a guy come here not too long ago, and I guess we had too much Bible going on here because he said, uh, y'all said service started at 10, but that was a Bible study because this is service to him, you know. Right. Amen. Right, Paul. I've watched people dance and act a fool and come to church and do all this stuff yep. and just as ignorant as a dog when it comes to the things of God in that Bible. Right. I've watched it. You've got a choice. Amen. There is a wisdom that is conceived in the minds of ignorant men and then there is the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. You don't gain access to this one until you acknowledge this up here. Amen. I promise you. By the time you come to Colossians, the seventh book that Paul wrote, the seventh book, he talks about coming to the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But if you're ignorant right here, you can forget about the depths of this. You're going to be wise in your own conceits. That's where the most of them are. Are they saved? Yes. The power of God unto salvation is the gospel of Christ. Are they established? Absolutely not. Do they have any real wisdom? Absolutely not. There's nothing more foolish than people that will fight over a water ordinance that none of them can explain, understand, or can defend. You heard me. People have split churches and fought. They would label me a heretic. And if you went and talked to them about baptism, they couldn't give you a scriptural backing for why they do it. Oh, you got to do it to be a part of the local church. Chapter and verse. Oh, it's the first step of obedience and following Christ. Chapter and verse. Amen. You know why Christ was baptized? Fulfill what? So you tell me that once you believe in Christ, He left something unfulfilled? Because if you're following Him in baptism, you're doing it to fulfill all righteousness. Oh yeah. Oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How what? And his ways pass what? For who hath known the mind of the Lord? The depths of this wisdom and knowledge of God are unsearchable. They're past finding out. You say well then how do we know them preacher? Well look at 1 Corinthians 2.
For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have what? Mm -hmm. You know what happened? You know, you know how you're going to know the depths of this wisdom and knowledge? You've got to have the mind of Christ. That's what God is offering you in that book. Is the mind of his son. He's offering you a spirit out of that book by which you can know the things that are freely given to us of God. By which you can know the deep things of God. By which you can come into a knowledge of the Father and His will. Just like His Son has. The mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, that you may prove that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Amen? And it's deeper. No matter where you are right now, it's further than where you are. It's deeper than where you've attained. It's higher than where you've reached. Broader than you can imagine. And longer than you will ever be able to figure out. So no matter where you've attained and where you are right now, there's somewhere deeper to go in this thing. There are depths that you have not yet reached when it comes to this thing. When Paul, when Paul writes, look at 1 Corinthians 2 again. Let's look at this. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 6. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are yet not the wisdom of this world nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And you got people you got people that learned a right division chart a year and a half ago that think they have mastered something. Yes, sir. Come on, park. Yeah, I'll park. Yeah. This mystery concerns a wisdom that God ordained before the world unto our glory. Watch what he says. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. None of the princes of the world knew it. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? But we have what? You're never going to comprehend the fullness of this wisdom until you have the mind of Christ. That's why when Paul writes Philippians, he said, Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. He's talking about those who have attained under this mind and knowledge of this mystery, they're now walking and pressing toward the prize of what they've been called to. They understand it, they're pressing towards it, and they're seeking to apprehend it. But it's deeper than what you can even imagine. Now look at what he says in verse 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us. You know what Paul said in Ephesians? That God hath made known unto us the mystery of his will. Amen. These things that I had not seen, this wisdom that none of the princes of this world knew, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. But I want you to understand this revelation. Not every person that's saved has it. Some of them are still stuck back there in ignorance of that. When Paul went to Corinth, he didn't speak these things to them. He said, I've preached Christ and Him crucified. Howbeit though we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, meaning this information concerning this wisdom and this mystery of God belongs to them that are perfect. What is it concerned? For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What does this wisdom of this mystery contain? This, this, this concerns a wisdom that is buried in the deep things of God. You think you've attained it? Some people are about as deep as this water bottle right here. 
We're talking about the Spirit of God revealing to, the, revealing to us deep things of God. And so what I'm about to share with y'all guys, we still ain't even got there yet. I'm laying a foundation. When we get into these depths, don't worry about what you've heard or this and that and this and other, all this other stuff. You're supposed to be a man that's coming in the comprehension of the deep things of God through having the mind of Christ. Now look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. Now remember these Jews and Greeks here. When Paul preached the gospel, a lot of the Jews and Greeks didn't receive it. They perished, but those who received it were the called. And then guess what? You take this group of called people and you start preaching this wisdom of the hidden things of God to it. And guess what? You've got another separation of natural and spiritual. The natural man can't receive it. The spiritual man discerns it. Amen? A vast majority of the called people are not going to attain under these deep things of God because they're carnal and they love the glory and their favorites and they're puffed up one for another and they're full of envy and contention and strife and divisions and glory in men instead of the Lord. Amen. And they're not going to attain. Amen? And so, boom. And wipe them out. Now it's our job, it's our goal to bring all men into a knowledge of this truth. But I can't stand here and preach Jesus wasn't talking to you for the next three years because I want to attract a crowd. And I don't want to go beyond what you're capable or what you're willing to go beyond. If you've attained on the right division, good. Let's move on. Or stay where you are. I don't care. We're going to keep pressing towards this thing. And if it's me and Timothy, when it's all said and done, it'll be me and Timothy. Look at chapter 3, verse number 1. And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. You know what Paul just said? He called these deep things of God as pertaining to the mystery, the meat. Now there's only one other place in the New Testament where milk and meat are brought up as pertaining to doctrine. I know Peter says desire the sincere milk of the word. We're talking about milk and meat. And it's Hebrews chapter 5 verse 10 through 14. And it's about a great high priest that has passed where? Made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You know what that is? That is a heavenly priestly order that has nothing to do with the earth. He is a high priest over the true tabernacle. This one down here was a pattern and a shadow of this. And he's telling these Jews, you have a great high priest that has passed up to here. And the world to come out here is subject to to this man that has passed into the heavens. Now, how many of y'all believe Hebrews is about Israel in the last days? When did Christ pass into the heavens? What has God been doing for the last 2,000 years? He's been building a body up here in the heavenly places. Yes. <clears throat> Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. And told you that God was going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And there's coming a day when this body is going to be raptured out of here. It's going to go up here and be established in the heavenly realm. 
And that doctrine is going to be essential for the Jewish people in understanding the new covenant and the world to come that's about to be brought to pass. And so Paul tells the Corinthians, I can't feed you with this meat because you're not able to bear it. And the writer of Hebrews is telling the Jewish people, I can't speak unto you concerning this high priest in the heavenly places because you're dull of hearing. Look at Hebrews 6.1. I want to show you a little structure. I love my King James Bible. See that first semicolon there in 6.1? I've got that, man, I've got that book stamped in my heart, man. See the first semicolon? Look back up there. See that phrase, doctrine of Christ? Stands almost in the middle of that thing. And on either side of it, you have principles and perfection. You see it? The principles of Christ were laid out under the law. That was milk. Where's the perfection of that doctrine? What did Paul call the meat? Well, you think, you think the meat changed when you got the Hebrews? Who does strong meat belong to them? Them that are of what? Who does this wisdom belong to? Them that are what? You say, you say, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm saying Romans through Philemon came before Hebrews. And the Jews don't get to rip Romans through Philemon out any more than you get to rip Isaiah through Malachi out. Amen. They ought to read and understand what has transpired over the last 2,000 years and what God has done in the heavenly places in preparation for this world to come. Amen? Don't worry, brethren. I'll, I'll bear the marks for you, okay? Now, you see this, this body that's been prepared up here in the heavenly places? Who does Israel in the earth serve under? Shadow an example of what? What's been established? A high priest over a better tabernacle over a superior order, and that priest has a body that's been given to him by God to purify the heavenly places, and Israel in the earth is going to serve under the shadow and example of this heavenly thing right here. Which is why Paul said, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Look what he said about them, which are a shadow of things to come. They weren't a shadow, they are. You know what that means? There's going to be a bunch of people one day that's subject to these things. But you're not them. Do you know in the millennial kingdom, if a nation doesn't keep come up and keep, the Feast of Tabernacles, God is going to shut up the rain from them. Do you know there's a verse that talks about from one new moon to the next shall all flesh come and worship before God? From one, what? Those are things to come. Who's the world to come subject to? And his what? So who do you think ordains those things to come? What's the body of? You have put off your old man by the circumcision of Christ and you are raised with Jesus Christ seated in the heavenly places with all that handwriting of ordinances that was against you and contrary to you, taken out of the way, it was nailed to the cross and taken out of your way. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 
And Paul says, if you be dead with Christ, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set those things that are what? There it is. Look at Hebrews 9.11 now. But Christ being come a high priest of what? Which are a shadow of what? Christ being come a high priest of what? Good things to come. Amen? Y'all with me? I hope you are. So y'all understand what I mean about the mysteries, fellowship, to this. You can't just stop at the mystery. All right? Why? Because Paul goes on to say, and by the scriptures of the prophets. Right there. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? And by what? You as a saved and called saint are not to neglect prophecy. You are to be established in obedience of faith to these things right here. Amen? Now, y'all give me a few moments here. Give y'all, let, let, let me let me wet y'all's beak in what we're going to be looking at. It is my belief that prophecy reveals the purpose of the mystery. It is my belief that prophecy, understanding prophecy, reveals the purpose of the mystery. Understanding the prophetic scriptures will help you understand the purpose of this mystery right here. So you are going to come to a greater understanding of your calling as you understand these things right here. Amen. Not only that, not only does prophecy help us understand the purpose of our calling, but the mystery is the means of fulfilling this. And so I'll go ahead and correct myself. I don't know what's going on. Let me go ahead. Let me let me go ahead and correct myself on something. I used to be the one that stood up here with with a timeline, and I would say you could take Paul's epistles out of the Bible, and John would pick up with the book of Hebrews like nothing ever happened. I was wrong. Completely, totally wrong. Hebrews to Revelation has no possibility of fulfillment without the mystery of Christ being fulfilled in heaven. Zero. Zilch. It was prepared and ordained before the foundation of the world. The kingdom that's coming to this earth has been promised and prepared from the foundation of the world. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. There was no chance of any of that other stuff coming to pass until God fulfilled the mystery that he had purposed and kept hidden himself from the beginning of the world. None. Romans through Philemon was to fulfill the word of God. Without it, the word of God was unfulfilled. So you can't take it out of nothing. It was as much a part of the Old Testament as it is the New. It was just hid and kept secret, but it was always in God. And so when God's back there making promises and saying he's going to do things, there's things that he's keeping hid. And so Satan's back there looking at these promises, trying to figure it out and how, how God's going to bring this stuff to pass. And the whole time, God's keeping the most important part of the information from him. Amen. And so, in Ephesians 3.8, Paul says this. I want you to notice here, guys, that the grace that was given to Paul was for a twofold purpose. There's a twofold purpose here. You say, how do you know? Semicolon right there. All right? Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. Number one, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so this grace that was given to Paul 
concerns the unsearchable riches of who? Christ. If you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, you'll learn what they are. They concern these blessings that God has blessed us with in the heavenly places. And you, God didn't just raise up Jews to set in this thing. He has now revealed that through Jesus Christ, those who were not only dead in sins, but us Gentiles who were in uncircumcision, now through Christ, now by the blood of Christ, we've been made nigh, and Christ is preaching peace to both Jews and Gentiles. And that God is taking Jew and Gentile, reconciling both in one body, for to make of those two people, Jew and Gentile, one new man in the heavenly places to feel and inherit the unsearchable riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul was given the grace to preach among the Gentiles, these unsearchable riches. See the word and? To make what? All men. Not just us. All men. Will that include Jews in the future? Yes, sir. All means all. All means all, don't it? Yeah. So Paul was not only to preach these unsearchable riches, this grace given to him to preach was also designed to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So just knowing about these unsearchable riches, you're still not established and you still haven't come to what God wants you to know fully. He wants you to understand the fellowship of this. The fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. You know what that means? These people out here after our rapture getting to go through the 70th week of Daniel, guess what they're going to have to know? They're going to have to understand this mystery as it pertains to prophecy and the eternal purpose of God. Now what a lot of people do is they come here and they talk about this fellowship of the mystery and they think it's the fellowship of Jew and Gentile. No. See the colon? Paul explains the fellowship in the next verses. It has nothing to do with fellowship of Jew and Gentile in anything. The intent of preaching these unsearchable riches and making all men see is to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Once again, I used to read this and think Paul was talking about the church teaching the angels something. No longer believe that. You say, why? Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed with all spiritual blessings where? You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then he comes down there and it says, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together, raised us up together, made us sit together where? The only time he talks about the angelic beings, the principalities and powers as it pertains to Satan and the angels that are up there now, he calls it spiritual wickedness in what? High places. Where's Christ seated? Far above all. All. These heavenly places is not the location of Satan and his angels. They're in the high places. Christ was seated far above. And you've been raised up and made to sit together with him in those heavenly places. And the intention of this is that there are principalities and powers that God has created in the heavenly places that is going to be filled and inhabited by His church. And the intention of this mystery is to fill that heavenly government with a people that know and understand His manifold wisdom according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you get up there... God wants you to know why you're going up there and what's coming. Yes, amen. Absolutely. amen. Guys, you've been created in Christ to wrestle and engage an enemy that's been in conflict with God for six millennia in this earth. Think about that. Then the armor is going to start making sense. 
Amen. I'm going to close with this right here. This is where we'll pick up next week. Romans 11, 25 through 27. Paul speaks of a mystery here. This mystery concerns blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now you know what that means. Right now, God is taking, or the, or the Israelites cut off. Have God cast away his people? No. no. At this present time, there is an election. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. Are all Gentiles being saved today? No. The gospel's been sent to all nations to call out of the nations a people for his name. When that fullness of the Gentiles comes in and that part of Israel, that fullness of the Gentiles is going to be placed with this part of Israel to fulfill a mystery purpose of God in the heavenly places that he chose us for in Christ before the world began. And it is my belief that what Paul was saying here is that when this mystery is fulfilled and completed, that mystery and the fullness of this thing is what's going to bring an end of the blindness of Israel. Absolutely. You read it. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Israel is going to be blinded in part until the fullness comes in. Now you say, I don't believe that preacher. You better go read 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and read it carefully. There's a veil over the heart of Israel in the reading of the Old Testament unto this day. Their hearts are blinded. Amen? And that veil is done away in who? In Christ. And we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are being changed into that same image from glory to glory to glory. You and I as this church are being transformed into that glorious image of God's Son. And one of these days that glory of the Lord is going to be revealed and Moses and all that stuff that is abolished is going to be put away and only this glory is going to remain. And so we are being transformed for a day of manifestation. Amen? And Israel is in blindness until that thing is fulfilled. You got it? Now look at what he says. And so, you see the word and? You know what that means? The prophetic salvation of Israel is connected back to what he just said in verse 25. Blindness in part until the fullness of the Gentiles become in and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, meaning the mystery is what's going to bring about the prophetic salvation of Israel that was written. Amen, amen, amen. That's why Paul said he was separated under the gospel of God which he had afore promised by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now let's look at this quote here. Because we'll get, we'll get somebody running their mouth about verbatim equivalencies. There's not a verbatim equivalent in the passage. They're verbatim opposites. There's nothing the same. You say, well, how do you explain that? Uh, Paul's writing scripture. He's under inspiration. The Holy Spirit is quoting Isaiah 59 the way he wants to. Because watch this thing. They're not the same. There shall come out of Zion. The Redeemer shall come to Zion. There's a difference between coming out of and coming to. There's a difference between a deliverer and the Redeemer. There's a difference in turning away ungodliness from Jacob and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. There's nothing the same in the passage. Amen? I want to tell you something. When you read Paul just quoting the mystery and say, I don't want you ignorant lest you be wise in your own conceits. And then he quotes Isaiah 59 and 20 and roughs that thing up 
where it's not even recognizable as Isaiah 59, 20, you better ask yourself why. You better ask yourself why. Amen. I ain't got time to get into this tonight, guys, because it starts getting deep. But what I'm telling you is that chapter right there, you know what was just said before you get to that Redeemer coming to Zion? God saying, God saying, I put on righteousness as a breastplate and salvation as a helmet upon my head. And I clothed myself with the garments of vengeance and clad myself with, the, with zeal as a cloak. Read that thing now. He first clothed himself with righteousness and salvation, and then he clothed himself with vengeance and zeal. What did Paul tell the body of Christ to put on? Breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That body of Christ is being clothed with that breastplate and that helmet. And that body of Christ is going to be raptured and then Christ starts putting on his garments of vengeance. The church is being created in heaven for something. Amen. Amen. Paul's the only one that quotes the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and he quotes it to you twice. In Ephesians 6 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Amen. And what Paul is writing out here well, we'll get into it next week, guys. Trust me, this stuff's going to get good. We just we got the foundation out of the way. And what you're, what you're reading about here when Paul says the Redeemer shall come, or when Isaiah says the Redeemer shall come to Zion, he's talking. Now, Redeemer and Deliverer are two different things. The Redeemer was here. Just like the Passover died, and then in Exodus 15, God delivered them from Pharaoh. Up here is the deliverer. But notice how Paul quotes it. The deliverer shall come what? Out of. So when he died on the cross and went back to heaven, guess what he went back to heaven as? And when he comes, guess who he is? And this deliverer is going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and then he's going to come unto them that turn from ungodliness, and then this shall be my covenant that I make with them. But what did God do between that point and that point? He made a church up here. And then he tells them Jews in the book of Hebrews, you've come unto the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. Amen. And so we'll get into this stuff, guys. Trust me, if you go back and study those prophetic scriptures that Paul alludes to in these things, and don't just, because this thing continues through chapter 60 all the way into chapter 64, which is going to be the next quote Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And these things continue on through here. You, right here you have the preparation for that day of vengeance. Isaiah 64 is about the heavens opening up and that vengeance coming and the things that God hath prepared up here is going to be revealed to them that wait for Him. They were prepared for them that love Him. Us, they're going to be revealed to them that are waiting for Him at the second coming. Amen. We'll, we'll get to this stuff. Any questions? No, absolutely not. I, absolutely not, Corn. And the breastplate was also a big part of the priest. Faith and love. Those, those, those names of the children of Israel were upon his breastplate, upon his heart. And we're told to put on the breastplate of faith and love. All right, that's what God wants us to be ministers of in the future is mercy, love, and peace, and things of that nature. Doctrine and truth? I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does, Corn. But uh, 
Guys, it's, it, it's, it's going to get deep. We just now getting started in this thing. But I hope you understand where we're going with it and, and comprehending what it is that we've been called to in the heavenly realm. And uh, I believe God wants us to have zeal as part of this mystery to have zeal not only in our calling but that, that salvation of Israel. I believe God wants us to have as much zeal about prophecy as we do the mystery. Amen. We're going up there where there's a dragon that's been warring against that woman since Genesis chapter 3. And we're going up there to get rid of that bomb and to, and to save God's people. Amen. And to become ministers of righteousness and life in the earth. Amen. All right, let's pray. Great Father God, we thank you for another day of life. God, I pray. Lord, as we go into this study, Lord, I know that we're getting into deep things, things that I've been sinking in, Lord, for a long time. And God, I, I thank you that you've given me uh, somewhat of an understanding of it, Lord. I can see these things a little more clearly than I ever have. Father, I just pray as we study these things and preach these things, I believe these people, Lord, have been brought for the last six years into a place of of discernment, spirituality, where they'll be able to discern these things. I pray, God, that you give us understanding of them, that we may comprehend the great depths of these things and, and know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that we can be filled with all your fullness. And God, I just ask now that you go and keep everybody safe and bring everybody back safely at the next appointed time. We ask it all in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.